halfway to your seats. We'll go ahead and get started tonight. Uh, we're in the uh, second section of notes establishing the, the counseling relationship. And we should be on page eight tonight. Page eight of establishing, talking about establishing our form. As always, if you have questions, come up here tonight. Uh, I will send two other questions, so I'll address the, those questions um, as we go through our lesson for tonight. <clears throat> so let's begin with uh, prayer this evening. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for our, uh, those who are here tonight. Thank you so much for the opportunity for us to uh, gather together to continue our study of Christian counseling. And uh, we pray, Lord, that as we uh, go through the material tonight and the discussion and any questions that come up that you will just uh, use what we learned tonight so that we will in turn be effective uh, ministers to those who are in need. Thank you for those you bring in across our path and uh, for the opportunity you give to us to provide comfort, encouragement, and instruction. And so we just continue to pray for our, uh, wisdom uh, to look at the material and see where uh, we could apply them in our lives so that we can uh, continue to be effective in our work with others. Thank you for our time together. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So last week as we began our section on getting started establishing the counseling relationship, uh, we looked at the importance of uh, both spiritual and practical preparation. And I think that I believe that the emphasis here was uh, be sure you are working on your own spiritual growth. And uh, because God brings people across your path, um, uh, spend a lot of time in prayer and uh, uh, growing yourself because uh, those are the things that are important as you minister to others. Uh, people around us today, and even more so during the times in which we live, are looking for answers to the uncertainty in life, the chaos in life, and just to uh, uh, know how to cope with what they are feeling mentally and emotionally right now. So as Christians, we need to remember that we have the answers. We have the answers based on the Word of God. We have a wonderful Savior uh, who has made our salvation uh, secure, and uh, we, we have the answers to provide hope to a lost world. And so even more so, we're gonna see, and you're gonna have an opportunity, I believe, to uh, have an important ministry, uh, not only to those outside of the church and to non-Christians, but even to those within the church. Just because you are a Christian doesn't mean that you are immune from anxiety, from depression, and a lot of the other emotional problems that uh, people have. All of us are, uh, there are times when we become anxious to the point where we cannot function properly. There are times when we become uh, very depressed. And, uh, uh, but we need to realize that uh, we serve, we love a God of miracles, a God who promises to take care of us and to protect us. And I emphasized last week that the practi practical preparation really isn't as important as a spiritual preparation. Uh, it's not necessary for uh, people like ourselves who are uh, counseling or just ministering to others uh, to have formal education. In fact, uh, if you um, go through a, like a formal course of training and counseling, uh, you will get a lot of uh, uh, unchristian kinds of uh, teachings. And uh, it's really important that we're able to wade through that. And I shared with you last week that one of the benefits in my life was to grow up in a Bible teaching church. And as a youngster, I was, I was saved at an early age, uh, but going to church was a very common thing. And so I went to Sunday school every Sunday, uh, morning worship service. Uh, there were times, like when I was in the second or third grade, uh, we were 
in a church building and was really hot. And uh, sometimes I would listen to the pastor as he preached, but I have to admit that at that young age, I sat there sometimes and said, okay, I wonder who's gonna fall asleep today. And so as I sat next to my parents, and I remember one lady, she fell asleep with glasses fell on the floor. I said, okay, got one this Sunday. So I wasn't always 100% focused on what was being preached. But Sunday school and, and attending church in the morning was a very common thing. And as I got older, attending Sunday evening service became a common thing as well. And then Wednesday night we had a prayer meeting and a Bible teaching. Uh, always went to those as well. And then we had a youth group. Uh, we met once or twice a month on a Friday evening. And uh, many opportunities to learn, to grow, and to put into practice uh, by giving devotionals, uh, doing different things within the church as a youth group that really uh, helped in my spiritual growth. So that when I went to college, and I went to a secular university, uh, I, I really thank the Lord that I had that basic Bible knowledge because I was able to discern what was right and what was wrong. Yeah. And I wish we talked about that last week, behavior modification. And there are things that were obvious to me. And there were things as I sat in church, uh, visiting churches there, uh, things that the pastor was preaching just wasn't right. So it led me to ask the, the right kinds of questions. What do you believe about the Bible? And so, the spiritual preparation, uh, whether you're an adult, and uh, especially with children and teenagers, uh, if you have a young child or a teenager, or, or your own child or your a grandchild, uh, really see what you can do to uh, encourage uh, being under the word, taking every opportunity. You know, there's technology now, there's uh, uh, on television, you can get good preaching, good teaching, uh, utilize those things because uh, it may serve them well, especially when they go out and they uh, get thrown into the secular world. Then last week we also looked at the 11 attitudes that we need to uh, watch out for. And I trust that you, you took a look at those and, and asked yourself, you know, are these some of the attitudes that I have as I minister to others? And if so, uh, is there anything I can do to change those things? These attitudes are, we're not, I didn't give them, those to you so that, uh, that, with the expectation that you will change in all these areas. Okay. Uh, just to be aware of it, that having these attitudes can really impact in a negative way uh, your ministry to others. And the one thing I wanted to emphasize is, you know, be patient. Not patient with others that you're working with, so patient with yourselves. Okay. Don't feel like you have to change and you have to become this person who might be a perfect counselor. And there's no such thing as a perfect counselor. Don't feel like you have to reach that, uh, that, that goal of being a perfect counselor. None of us possess all of these. And none of us are able to eliminate all these negative attitudes that we have towards other people. Tonight I want to start by looking at talking about establishing rapport. If, if you're in a situation where uh, as we talked about last week, there are times when it's not necessary to establish rapport. A person comes to you um, and you're gonna either decide, okay, let's pursue this further, let's talk some more. Or you might, you might say, you know, this is something that's above my head, over my head, so I'm gonna make a referral elsewhere. Or there could be possible medical issues that a person might express to you and you might recommend before you begin any kind of counseling to uh, uh, make a referral or encourage them to see their primary care physician to go from there. So there are different states. Every person who comes to you um, does not mean you will be counseling them or providing any kind of support to them. Uh, usually in the first uh, 10 minutes you can determine uh, this person isn't ready for counseling or counseling is not the issue and so a referral is necessary. Okay, so but when if you're in a situation where a person comes to you and says, uh, hey, could I talk to you? I, you know, I've got this thing that I'm wrestling with. Um, the first step would be establishing rapport. And establishing rapport, uh, in my own training, 
was was um, an area that we placed a lot of emphasis on. Our clinical professors worked with us on uh, how to go about establishing rapport uh, because if you can establish that relationship with another person and they feel comfortable in talking with you, um, in many in many cases that's half the battle won. Okay? Because if a person comes to trust you, then it just opens up doors. They're open, they're, they're receptive to any ideas that you have, suggestions that you make. And there are times when um, you have to admit, uh, not everyone that comes to you and you work on establishing rapport, you're not gonna be able to establish that really solid rapport 100% of the time. Okay, so there are gonna be times when you have to say, you know what, uh, we're, we're, we've hit an impasse or uh, we just don't fit. Okay? And it's okay to do that. Doesn't mean that you're a failure. Yeah, I wanna emphasize that. Uh, don't, don't think that you have to help 100% of people who come to you. Okay? And uh, there are many, many people you know, over my career in church and secular situations where I had to tell them, you know, we're at an impasse. Uh, I don't believe I can help you anymore. And uh, uh, for whatever reason, it's not a fit. So let me try to find someone who might be you know, willing to work with you. Or maybe you have an idea of uh, what, what route you want to go. So it doesn't mean that everybody comes to you, you have to uh, uh, help them, okay? Or that you're gonna be able to help them. And uh, that's, that's one of the things um, to keep in mind that um, you're not gonna be successful with every single person. Okay? But establishing rapport is, is really important. So one of the things that we, we consider when we're establishing rapport is, uh, first of all, just having a place, a lot of times, as we're, as we're called to help others, we'll go into their homes or we'll invite them to our homes. Um, I guess meeting at restaurants was one of my favorite things, but I guess you can't do that you know, now for a while. But wherever you meet that person, be sure that it's a place where uh, it's free from distractions and it's a somewhat comfortable environment where you can have uninterrupted discussion. And a lot of things I share with you come from the training I received. I was, I was trained in clinical psychology in a very traditional, uh, of, you know, sit, uh, uh, traditional format. Or, uh, if you look at the 70s, um, we never saw people outside of an office setting. Uh, and I share with you, we had a, when I was in graduate school, we had a, uh, a psychology clinic, which was very rare at that time for a master's degree program. And we, we always saw our clients within the office setting. And one of our, one of my fellow students uh, on a spring day in Indiana, you know, it was really nice and warm, warm and after a, a nasty winter, uh, took his client outside and sat on the tree. And he was sternly reprimanded by the professor. He says, you do not take a person outside to do counseling or therapy. And the reason for that is that there are so many distractions. Okay? There are distractions. You're, you're talking with someone, if people are walking by, the person can't focus, and probably you can't focus. And uh, another thing too, maybe not so much here, but in a clinical setting, that's a violation of confidentiality. That is one reason at the, at the school, I never saw kids out in the courtyard, even during um, when classes were in session and I called the student, they always came up to my office. Because even though most of the kids didn't know who I was, some of them knew, ah, oh, there's Mr. Dome with school-based behavioral health. So he's saying so-and-so, there must be something wrong with that person, okay? So I wanted to protect my students from uh, being ostracized and being you know, uh, ridiculed for seeing me. So whenever I scan a center pass, they always came to my office. And I told, I would tell the teachers, I'm gonna leave a pass in your box. When you give the pass to the student, don't announce it. Don't say, oh, hey, so-and-so, Mr. Dolman wants to see you up at the SVB office, okay? Because all the other kids will hear that. So when you're talking with someone, just kind of keep that in mind. Have a place that's um, free of any distractions, free of interruptions. Make sure you turn off your cell phone and the other person turns off the cell phone. That's something we didn't have to deal with 
30 years ago, but uh, that's something that I often have to deal with at the high school. And we have them, and the students knew they, they turn off their cell phone. Okay. But we had strict policies too. If, they, if I talked to the cell phone, I said, you have to turn it over to me and give it to the vice principal, and your parent has to come after school to pick it up. You can't pick it up. And so they knew what the consequence was. So they said, they knew that I have to enforce that as well. Uh, beware of things that we take for granted. Your eye contact, your, uh, uh, how loud you speak, uh, your distance that you spend, your posture, uh, your positioning of the furniture. And I shared uh, oftentimes that uh, throughout my career, I never sat directly across uh, a table with someone. Okay, whenever I, I sat with them, I would always position my chair at an angle so that I would be looking this way and the, and the student or adult could look this way here. Okay, so, um, because some people uh, don't like to be stared at. Okay, and one of my things I feel very comfortable with is I can look at a person's eye for 30 minutes straight without taking my, and I feel comfortable talking with them. Okay, but early in my career I realized some people aren't comfortable having someone stare at them and I wasn't really staring, I was just looking at them. But, uh, but you sense they're, they're kind of uh, uncomfortable. So from early on, I decided whenever I position my chairs, it'll be not like this, but at an angle. So that um, uh, I could look this way here. If I wanted to look at them face to face, I could turn. Uh, they could do the same thing. Okay. If you're sitting around a table at someone's home, uh, try not to sit across each other. Uh, someone sit at the, at the head of the table and then the other person here so you can look at that person. That's one of the little things about establishing rapport. You try to make a person comfortable even in their own home or wherever you may uh, meet with them. Okay. Um, I used to have chairs of equal heights okay. because sometimes if you have an executive chair, uh, you sit a little higher um, then people look at you and said, okay, you're the authority, all right? So in my office at Pearl City High School, I eventually had two executive chairs. And I had regular chairs, and the students could, I, you know, they, they came into the office, they could sit anywhere. So some of the guys would sit in the executive chair, and they would move, you know, back and forth, and they just you know, felt comfortable. And that was fine with me, I was in my chair, we were at the same level, okay? So that was a little, I don't want to say a trick of the trade, but it really helped as far as developing that relationship. And also, um, uh, we'll talk about uh, encouraging uh, whoever you're talking to just to express themselves, and, uh, uh, and then you, as a, as a counselor, uh, reflecting uh, what, they are, what they are saying. And we'll talk about that as we look at uh, counselor responses. Um, one of the things that people who uh, try to or attempt to counsel others, they have to really work on is not showing um, surprise uh, or shock facially in their facial expression. Okay? So if you're talking with someone and they tell you something that you never heard of, if you gasp, all right, or you go, <laughs> you know, uh, they know, okay, you're uncomfortable yourself dealing with this subject. That's why, that's why you know, students and some adults would come in over the years and say, Mr. Dolman, if I tell you something, you're gonna fall out of your chair. I said, no, I've heard everything on this side. If I tell you something, you're gonna fall out of your chair. And I told you the story last week about uh, a nurse in, in my day treatment program in Idaho who was seeing those little green people with their white cone hats and hallucinating. And the people told, little green people told her to get her husband got and wait for him and when he came home and shoot him. Okay. And so uh, the last several years when I was speaking the uh, advanced place in psychology class, a teacher, teacher said, Paul, uh, tell the class about the little green people. Okay. And uh, I wasn't surprised, but when I, when I, when I share that story about you know, what happens in the, the, the real life in the mental health field, uh, you see the eyes of the students get wide, okay? But I've also seen situations where counselors' eyes, not school counselors, but in the mental health setting, their eyes get wide because they've never heard something. And some of the things that they hear are really horrific or it's really shocking, okay? So what we, what, one, one thing you can work on is work on just keeping your composure, okay? 
keeping your composure. And uh, after a while, if you hear a lot of things, it doesn't, uh, it, it might bother you, but you don't show it, okay? Because uh, that can impact the establishment of rapport as well. And of course, uh, refrain from censoring or judging what the counseling says and encourage that person to suggest and discuss own uh, solutions. And another thing is maintain a confidential attitude towards all discussion, okay? Uh, one of the things that over the years, uh, whenever I talk to someone, I don't tell Carol what, uh, uh, whether it was in the church or in the mental health stuff. Uh, she didn't need to know and she didn't want to know. And so we never discuss, you know, work. If we discuss work, we'll say, oh, it was a rough day today. Okay. But it, it's not, um, uh, it's something that I think, I believe is really private, it's personal, and so uh, I don't uh, want anyone to know uh, what we talked about. So, all right, any, any thoughts or questions right now? Okay, the art of listening, let's go on to the art of listening. How many of you have ever talked to uh, other people who are really long-winded? I think we all have, yeah? And how easy is it to maintain your focus and your concentration? Difficult, right? It's difficult. Uh, if you talk with your spouse and you have trouble just focusing for five minutes, hearing what your spouse says, imagine talking with someone for an hour and going back and forth and really uh, focusing and concentrating and remembering what the person said. And I've shared with you, I got caught in the early years of my career in Idaho, when I was seeing someone in the afternoon in my office, um, and I was tired, I had a stressful morning, and uh, the person came in and was talking, and my mind was wandering, I was looking at him, but my mind was wandering, and then he asked the question, well, what do you think about that? And I had not heard a single thing that person said, okay? And they didn't train us to do this, they just said, focus, concentrate, this is what the person said, but I, the only thing I could think of is, well, what do you think? Okay. And then the person went on and on and said, okay, I, I, you know, I got saved in that situation. But I could pick up where the person left off. Okay. Uh, as much as possible, that's going to happen. If you talk to someone who is really long-winded, uh, your mind will start wandering. And if that's happened to you, then and if, you, if a person has to ask, well, or you have to ask, what did the person just say? and you don't know, then uh, you were not able to effect effectively listen. Okay. So, um, I mentioned here on the top of page nine, as a side note, the counselor should never have to repeat himself or herself. So you shouldn't have to ask, oh, could you repeat that again? Because that's an indication that you really weren't listening in the first place. Okay. The art of listening is not an easy easy thing to do. It's not something that you can attain easily. We used to do we used to do practice sessions before we saw real clients in graduate school. We did practice sessions, executive sessions, and it was only five minutes long. Where we would pair up in class and we we talk. One person would talk, other one would listen. At the end of five minutes, the other the person who's listening would have to summarize in his or her own words what the other person said. It's amazing. Even with clinicians and training we never heard accurately, or we would say, oh, you said this, no, I didn't say that, okay? Listening is not very easy to do. One of the reasons when I was in, in mental health, I did not like to work with couples. I did not like to work with families, right? Because when you, have, when you have couples, you're dealing with three problems, really. Individuals, I work with that individual. When you work with couples, you have the, the husband and the wife, but then you have the relationship, so there's three problems. So you have to really focus on what one person is saying, the other person is saying, but then you have to really look, listen carefully what's, what they're talking about as far as the relationship. Now imagine if you have a, a husband, wife, mother, dad, and you have three children, and you bring them off for family therapy. You got six issues, five individuals, but then the, the family dynamics, okay? So if someone ever comes to you and says, oh, can you see my husband and I, or can you, you know, meet with uh, our, our whole family, uh, I would strongly encourage you not to do, not to get involved in that. Okay? Unless you really have an interest and you feel you have a gift in working 
with that with that group. I mean, one on one, I'm fine, uh, but couples, you know, I, you know, that's why I never, uh, I, I didn't do a whole lot of marriage counseling. I did some, but uh, you know, my shoulders were dropped when they, they wanted marriage counseling or family therapy. Okay, so what's the remedy on listening? Well, work on concentrating on what the other person is saying. So you listen and you observe. Okay. So one of the things you do is you focus on what they're saying and then also look at um, the nonverbal kinds of behaviors, how they're dressed, the things that they say over and over again. For example, if someone says, well, I know I shouldn't think this way, and then later on they, they, they talk more and says, well, I know that's not a good thing to think. Okay, that's something you can pick up later because they have a negative view of themselves where they say they're putting themselves down. Well, I shouldn't think this way, or I don't know why I think this way, or I shouldn't be you know, saying this kind of things. That's something that you can address during the counseling session. Okay, so when you listen carefully to what they're, not only what they're saying, but also how they're saying it, that, that gives you a clue. Um, you, you see how they're dressed. Okay, you see how they're dressed. So, session number one, person comes in well-groomed, okay? You meet with them fourth time, and they're coming and say, wow, you know, uh, for, for guys when we meet, uh, he hasn't shaven, you know, he hasn't shaved for a while, clothes are really wrinkled, he doesn't comb the hair. Those are clues, okay? those are clues. When I see that happening, you compare, okay, this is how the person was, how, how they look, session one and four sessions down, and I'll start asking questions. Have you been depressed? You know, have you been depressed? Um, tell me about your day. Tell me about how you function at work or at school. Um, you know, uh, are you optimistic about the future? What is going on? Because those are clues, the nonverbal kinds of things. So even as you know, lay counselors, those are the kinds of things that will give you clues that you can follow up uh, later on. Okay, so you, you look at their appearance, their dress, their walk, their talk, preoccupations, general health, uh, their knowledge, uh, those will all give you clues. So if you focus on those things, then uh, you're on your way towards developing good listening skills. Okay. Again, be patient. Not necessarily with the individual, be patient with yourself. Okay. Not all of us, I think all of us, I know I'm for myself, all of us can st <coughs> still improve as far as uh, developing good listening skills. Number three, I just wanted to share this with you. <clears throat> Other suggestions, be sure that you are well rested before you do any counseling. Be sure you are well rested. How many of you are morning people? How many of you are late night people? Okay. So for you late nighters, people don't want to talk to you late at night. Okay. If you say, hey, how about we get together I'll come to your house at 11 o'clock at night. You know, you're not going to get any takers, okay? But if you're a morning person, I'm a morning person, you know. I can get up at 6 and I'm ready to go. And uh, uh, that's why my practice and at the high school, I see most of my uh, clients at the, in the morning hours because that's when I was precious. Um, you, think that, you think that we struggle with <coughs> being uh, alert and, and refreshed. Uh, professional psychologists and social workers, they struggle with that too. When I was in Roseburg, Oregon, uh, my position was a psychiatric social worker to the supervisor. I wasn't a social worker, but that was the title of my position, uh, psychiatric social worker to the supervisor. So half my responsibility um, consisted of seeing individuals on an outpatient basis, individual, marriage, you know, therapy, and so on and so forth. The other half was uh, supervising the day treatment program, uh, the workers who did the pre-commitment investigations when someone needs to be hospitalized and they didn't want to go. And uh, also look, working and doing a lot of administrative things. And then when the clinic director was gone on vacation or I took over the clinic, and both the clinic director and myself would tell our staff, do not schedule eight people in your day. Okay? Do not schedule eight people. In other words, one session every hour. Because by the time you get to number six, you're going to run out of gas. Okay? You're not going to be able to concentrate. You're not going to focus. So they said, well, what should we do? They said, schedule four people. 
schedule for people, spend the rest of the time in professional development, reading, doing your case notes and whatever. But don't, do not spend your entire one after the other, you know, time in, in session because you're not going to be effective in listening. Okay. And uh, uh, we, we had an individual who just scheduled eight people and he was always tired. He, he couldn't, he couldn't last. And, and so, you know, that, that goes in just a practical thing. Be sure you're rested. Uh, uh, don't see someone after you worked hard in the yard. If you worked hard in the yard and you go, or you have to do some project and you go to counseling, you're not gonna, you're not gonna be effective. You're gonna be tired. You might fall asleep. Okay, like some psychiatrists I knew, I worked with that fell asleep in sessions. All right. And as I mentioned, limit outside distractions and be patient. Primarily, be patient with yourself. Okay. Okay. Now, uh, the bottom of page nine to um, the middle of page 10 are general common uh, counselor responses. And my suggestion here as you look at these um, uh, is to, it, this, I just gave you some examples of different kinds of responses as you talk with people. Okay? So you're still in the process of establishing rapport. So what your, your focus during this time is to understand what the person is coming to you with, what the problem is or what the issues are. So you're not, you're not at the point of giving advice at this point. Okay? You're not uh, giving them suggestions on what they need to do. You're just trying to understand what they are saying and what they need. So what you do when you have these counselor responses, uh, you are helping yourself to understand better where the person is coming from and making sure that what they are saying uh, and what they mean is uh, you understand that so that you're not going to be off base as you as you work with them. So one of the things will be, and I, I believe many of you are good at this, understanding through reflection. So you reflect the person you're talking to, reflect the feelings, uh, the thoughts, and the examples I gave you are here. I just can't take it any longer, must do something. And so uh, one way of reflecting is you summarize in your own words. You seem to be completely fed up and you know there's no way out you can't find a way out so that's an example of reflecting and the person if the person says no that's not what I'm feeling okay that's good because it all is helping you to clarify with that person what he really means okay so uh, even though you reflect and it's not accurate that's okay because uh, by clarifying and the person you know, explaining what he or she really meant it's going to give you, it's going to uh, 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 enable you to more accurately determine what is going on. Okay? Does that make sense to everyone here? Okay. And, uh, you know, it's so bad knowing she's in the hospital, there's nothing, absolutely nothing I can do, and you feel anxious and entirely helpless right now. So you have, you have that, that response, it's a reflective response. Uh, number two is interpretive, and uh, I've seen this uh, happen. I, I, you know, my own situation. Sometimes uh, folks come in and uh, they say, you know, for some reason I don't know why uh, I'm angry with you. I'm afraid. I'm fearful of you. And uh, you know, after having gotten some uh, other information, this is well. Uh, I remember that uh, you had a really difficult uh, life growing up. And your father, uh, your father uh, mistreated you, and uh, you've been fearful and uh, uh, towards many, many male adults. So perhaps that could be happening here. And uh, so you you try to give some interpretation. Again, if if they say it's it's not uh, it's not correct, then you can use that to clarify and get a, a better understanding. Uh, I think all of us do well at supportive. We're supportive of uh, others, but we encourage we encourage others as are talking with us. Uh, number four is probing. Uh, you seek further information through questioning. And then when you get to five, you're in the counseling process. Okay, you're past the uh, establishing rapport and a response which indicates the counselor has made a judgment of goodness, appropriateness, effectiveness, and rightness. Okay, so. You're going to be sharing basically your 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 judgment. 
Then number six is advice. Telling someone else how to behave, what to do or not to do. So you're trying to uh, get to that position where the person you're talking to will be able to verbalize possible solutions. Okay, so to number six, uh, there was a question that was sent to me. Um, you know, when we say advice, telling someone else how to behave, what to do or not to do. Okay. The question was, when is it appropriate, if ever, to express tough love or to intervene when a counselee understands advice but doesn't follow it? Okay. I'll read that question again. When is it appropriate, if ever, to express tough love or to intervene when a counselee understands advice but doesn't follow it? What do you think? It's appropriate. Okay, <laughs> I'm going to share that. It, it is appropriate. Okay, and uh, uh, many times we had to do that, especially uh, when, when we talk about doing homework. Okay, uh, and you're further along now. You're you're past the rapport stage, and you have that comfortable relationship with that individual. You get to the point where they're not doing their homework, they're not following up on what you uh, advise them to do. And so you tell it the way it is, you know. I, I've had to do that with uh, teenagers in high school. You know, we've been meeting week after week and you say you're gonna do this, but you haven't. Uh, you know, I sense that you really don't care. Am I wrong? Am I right? You, it was not important to you, okay? So sometimes, Sometimes, even though you don't tell it like it is, especially at the beginning, there are times in the, in the process where you have to do some confrontation. Okay, Counseling, kind of keep this in mind, counseling isn't always saying, oh yeah, you're a great person, I agree with you, oh that's okay. No, counseling means that sometimes you have to come down hard. Okay, You have to tell a person, you know, what you're doing is sin. Okay, You know, that that's that's accurate than saying, oh, you know what, things are, will get better, just trust the Lord and uh, lean on Him and these problems will go away. No, sometimes you have to be specific and say, if, and this is where as you counsel, you can hopefully get them to verbalize what will happen. If you continue with this behavior, with this sin, what do you think is gonna happen? Rather than you telling them, get them to verbalize. The reason for that is they, if they verbalize and they own that, they're more likely to follow through with it and apply it okay, than if I spoon feed someone. Okay. So when is it appropriate uh, to express tough love? Well, when uh, there are times when we need to do that. Okay. Uh, if there's sin, we cannot condone the sin, and we need to, we need to tell people, uh, tell them that. Okay, and I'll save the second question when we get to page 11. Okay, so, mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm is a counselor response, okay? We all do that, right? Uh-huh, uh-huh, okay. And uh, I'm, I'm hoping that when you do that, ask yourself, okay, am I saying it just to fill the gap or, and you really aren't following, but I'm just, you know, in the habit of saying that. Okay. If, you, if you really mean it, that means you're with the person or you're, you're making every attempt, putting forth the energy, the, the effort to understand where the person is coming from and what the person is saying. Okay, so uh -huh is a, you know, is a response. Silence. You think silence counseling is is not a, a game where we try to see who can talk the most. Okay, silence is uh, very very important. It's uh, necessary. It's therapeutic okay, because during times of silence, a person is clarifying. A, a, a person can be processing, can be really meditating on what you said and, and thinking about things that came up as uh, uh, they were being, uh, uh, they were discussing with you. Okay, so silence is, is really effective. Um, I share with you when I was in graduate school, I had a group therapy professor and uh, he would often, as, as uh, he said in his practice, he would just go in the room and say nothing. And sometimes the silence would be 10, 10 minutes. But then after a while, uh, someone would become really anxious because people can't stand silence, right? If you were in a group for 10 minutes and nobody said a single thing, I can guarantee you're gonna feel really anxious, okay? And how do I know that? 
as part of the requirement for our group therapy class, we had to go to a group. We went to the, the University uh, Counseling Center and a bunch of us were in, in group once a week there. And it was open-ended. The psychologists uh, who were running it, uh, they pretty much left it to us what we want to talk about. It wasn't really therapy, it was more, they called it sensitivity training. Okay? And so, uh, so a lot of us, we just sat there. But I know the anxiety and tension rose of nobody's thing. Then finally somebody would say something, it was like breaking the ice. Okay? But during that time, when everyone was quiet, uh, there was a lot of thinking going on. And so as we share the thoughts, you know, some of the thoughts were, well, I wonder who's going to be the first to open his mouth. Well, I hope so-and-so, he's a talkative person, I hope he'll share his thoughts first. Okay? But silence can be used effectively, and we'll talk about that a little more. Okay, errors to avoid. I know we're going through this quick, but I'll, I'll give you an opportunity to ask questions. Errors to avoid, bottom of page 10. Don't say it like it is until you assert the rapport has been established. Okay. Um, there are people, uh, there are professionals whose, whose attitude is, well, I'm just gonna tell it like it is. And uh, if they don't like it, then too bad. Okay. And that's not, that's a terrible attitude to have, to say it like it is. Um, because it conveys that I'm the authority, I, I'm all wise, and you ought to listen to what I have to say without any resistance. Okay. Uh, don't diagnose, don't diagnose. Okay. And when you look at diagnosing, um, in reality, diagnosing doesn't, doesn't help. Okay. Um, example, when I was at high school, when I was hired at school-based behavioral health, we were told that um, we follow not the medical model where you diagnose and you have treatment, we follow the educational model. Okay? The only people who would diagnose would be our clinical psychologists uh, under whom we worked. Okay? One thing I found out really quickly is over the years is whenever I went to these meetings with, uh, with the parents and students, the teachers were the first ones to throw around diagnosis. They say, oh, uh, this person is bipolar or has a you know, major depressive disorder or ADHD here, okay, or has a anxiety disorder. Um, and I remember sitting in there and said, you know, I thought that we were an educational model. And, but then I would ask, um, so what good is it to diagnose? Okay, this person is bipolar, what are you gonna do about it? What does that tell you? They couldn't say anything, okay. So, um, you might be tempted to diagnose. And there are some things, yeah, you're gonna see when we get to depression, you're gonna be able to diagnose that. But don't make that a habit of, okay, this person is, you know, uh, schizophrenia, chronic, undifferentiated type. <laughs> now, for, for me, uh, that's what I was trained to do. And by the way, the diagnose, diagnostic manuals that you say, when I was in graduate school, we had this manual that was about this thick, okay? It's called a DSM was DSM-1, Diagnostic and Statistical Manual. Okay, this was back in 1975. And it had depressive neurosis, psychotic depression, had ADHD, anxiety, neurosis, and adjustment reaction of adolescents. That was a big one. A lot of adolescents, they, they had that diagnosis. Adjustment reaction, that could mean anything. The manual today uh, is that thick. You know, it's called a DSM, I think, the last one, DSM-4 revised. So they went through four revisions. And when you look at that thing, uh, it's really, really complex. Okay. So if you're gonna really accurately, if you really wanna get to accurately diagnose, you have to look at that, but you know, people are quick to throw around diagnosis. Okay. If you say, you know, oh, my child is ADHD, the question I'll ask generally is, is it attention type or is it impulsive type? So, or is it activity type? Is it attention, lack of attention, or attention deficit, hyperactivity? So, so it's gonna be either attention, or it's gonna be overactivity. Or you can have the combined type, we have both of them. So if you say, oh, my child is ADHD, you know, the, the way we use the diagnose in mental health is we give the teacher, we give the parent, and we give the child surveys, a one-page survey, they would fill out, we compare it. 
and we would use that in a diagnostic. We'd ask in detailed questions. Um, um, what, you know, does your child climb on the roof? So yeah, it does. Okay, they're they're involved in risky behavior. That's one of the characters. If your child climbs on the roof, uh, be careful. Okay, that's a sign of ADHD involvement in risky behavior. But um, don't don't diagnose. That's the safest thing to do. Number three, don't assume the counseling is committed to work on issues. Okay? Just because a person comes in and wants to talk to you doesn't mean that uh, he or she is going to be ready or committed. Uh, and you're going to see this. I think Dan brought the thing about how do you measure progress. If you find that um, the, the individual has not uh, made any progress, um, then there's a reason behind that. It could be that they're not ready yet to deal with the the issues that you're uh, uh, trying to, just because they, they're, they're resistant uh, doesn't mean that the person isn't committed. Okay? So you might think, oh, they're resistant, they don't want to talk about it, so uh, they're not invested in counseling, they don't want to talk about it. No, it just could be that they're not ready for it at this time. Okay? And then don't get off the track, number four. Watch your attitude, which we talked about. Watch your nonverbal behavior. And wide open eyes, gasping, that reveals shock. Uh, do your best to remain in control. Don't get too involved. We are to display empathy, bear one another's burdens, and show concern. But getting too involved to the point of getting sick yourself renders yourself useless and unable to view things objectively. Okay. The question that was sent in was, is it selfish to prioritize your well-being? when empathizing with another's burdens. Okay, Philippians chapter 2, verses 3 and 4 tells us we are to put others in front of before ourselves. Okay? But is it selfish to prioritize your well-being when empathizing with another's burdens? Okay? What, what do you think? Is it selfish? You know, if, if you don't take care of yourself, let me say, if you don't take care of yourself, and uh, you're not going to be any good to anybody else. Okay? Um, uh, I've seen people, uh, I've seen even counselors, uh, they come out of sessions and they're crying as much as the client, okay? Or they get sick because they take the problems home. Okay? If you are one that um, takes problems home, you, you talk with someone and then it stays with you, uh, that's, not a, that's not a good thing. Okay? You might, then you might evaluate yourself and ask yourself, should I be working with this person? Okay, should I be working with this person? Um, one of the most difficult uh, areas or, or problems to deal with is uh, suicidal ideation. When people think about killing themselves. Okay. And uh, uh, some people have a hard time dealing with that. A person who uh, feels like they're going to kill themselves and they, they take it home with them and they, they, they uh, worry about that, they think about that. They can't sleep at night, and uh, it goes on for several days, and it just uh, uh, puts them in a very, very, uh, well, you know, very, very sad state. Okay, and as much as possible, if you're going to be, you have to look at what your limits are. As much as possible, um, and I don't know how, how to teach you that, but you have to try to be objective. You you empathize your concern, but there are some things you have to say. Okay. I'm not going to deal with that uh, anymore. Okay, I've had many people talk about suicide. This, this is what helps me. Okay, this is what has helped me over the years. I always tell myself that I'm going to give it my best shot. I'm going to do all that I can to help that person. But when it comes down to it, that person has personal responsibility. Okay, I'm going to do all that I can. Uh, but then. If a person decides to pull a gun and shoot themselves or hang themselves, I'm not going to be there to stop them. Okay. Now, when I, I share with you, when I first got out of graduate school and I started work, I got a call on a Saturday afternoon uh, from this lady I was talking to. Her sister was holding a gun to her head um, and was threatening to kill herself. And I could hear the sister crying and this lady I was talking to, had to talk to, she was crying. The kids were in the background screaming. Kids were only in elementary school at that time, okay. And so I, I, I talked to her, talked to her, and uh, uh, but 
and then I, I said, well, let me, let me go out and, and talk with you, you know, try to settle things. And I went out there and she had enough supports. And I went back home. You know, even at that early time, I wasn't bothered by it. I didn't lose sleep over it. Okay. And, uh, and, but then I realized what, what happened. I was thinking, okay, I am not, I cannot be responsible for the results. I cannot be totally responsible for what people do or do not do. I'm going to do my best. So what I did with her, I did my best to assess her level of depression. I did my best to put throw everything, assess her lethality, to what degree was she a suicide risk, and the steps and the, the interventions that were available to me, which were very limited, and that's all I could do, and provide support. Uh, back then, we didn't have an emergency number, so I was it. So it was practice back in the 70s for us as therapists to give people our home number. Okay. And that was, that was something we all, we all did. So, and we gave agencies, so the sheriff, the police, you know, department, uh, social service, they, they would call, doctors would call in the middle of the night and say, hey, we got this person at the hospital, can you come help us, right? But what I, what I did was to try and I did my best, like I'm gonna do my best to thoroughly assess, thoroughly take the steps that I can with the resources that are available to me, but after that, it's up to that person, up to that person. So any, anything else, any other problem other than suicide, uh, suicide ideation, uh, I approach it that way too. And that has worked for me, okay, that has worked for me. I can talk with someone who's going through a difficult time. Doesn't mean that I don't care, but I can still go to sleep at night, okay. If you find yourself you can't go to sleep at night, then maybe in that particular case or that kind of situation, you shouldn't be involved, you shouldn't be working. In other words, no, yeah, find out what your limits are. It's okay to say, hey, I can't help everybody. I can't help everyone. This is what I feel comfortable with. Yeah. Just like for me. I don't, I don't feel, I, I do, I've done marriage counseling, I've done family therapy, but uh, that's not my favorite, that's not my forte, okay? And, uh, and by the way, when we talk about diagnosis, going back to the diagnosis part, <coughs> people throw around diagnosis, but when someone says, I'm bipolar, or I have a major depressive disorder, or my doctor said I'm borderline psychotic, first thing that, 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 that where the diagnosis helps me is saying, what kind of medication are you on, if any? Okay, because those are the, those, those bi bipolar, major depression, uh, anxiety, um, uh, especially all the, the psychotic disorders. Uh, first thing we ask, I will ask is, what kind of medication? Who are you seeing for the medication? If you're taking medication, how long have you been on it? Okay. So that's where a diagnosis helps. If a, if a parent comes in and says, oh yeah, my child has uh, is dealing with ADHD, I'll ask, is, is uh, uh, the child on uh, Ritalin or you know, methylphenidate, which is the other term for it, or what kind of medication? How long is it, is it effective? Is it helpful? How often are you seeing the doctor for that? Okay. That's where a diagnosis comes, is, is helpful. Uh, when there's uh, situations where uh, it can be addressed or it can be helped uh, through psychiatric evaluation and medication. Okay. But other than that, unless, uh, you know, usually for, you know, sort of diagnosis is, is just you throwing out a term. Okay, let me pause any questions here. Okay, I'm gonna pass out something that is not in your, it's something I decided to do last week. Oh. It's only one page. Um, so we'll talk about this for a little, little bit and uh, I'll, I'll, then I'll pass out the next hand of the third section of maintaining the counseling relationship. In this, in this, in this forum, there's one page uh, entitled "Counseling Plans." 
I mentioned here that um, in any ministry that you have, in any ministry that um, that you have as far as counseling, I highly recommend that you develop some kind of counseling plan. Okay. Now, <clears throat> when I was in training, uh, one of the things we had to do is part we do the assessment, and then uh, before we even started uh, counseling therapy, uh, we focused on the Curtis get one. Uh, okay. So. Before we even started working on, uh, you know, with individuals, after we did the assessment, uh, and then we got all the information, uh, we formulated uh, a plan, a counseling plan. We call it the treatment plans. When I got to uh, Department of Education, and school-based behavioral health started, I think, about 2001, when the Department of Health, Mental Health Services went over to the Department of Education. So when I was hired in 2002, I believe, uh, first question I asked is, um, uh, what's your required forms that you have? And so, well, what required forms? All right, like, do you have treatment plans? Because that's what I was trained to do. Do you have uh, a, a formal way, an informal way even, of uh, conceptualizing the, the situation, the case? And they said no. So what I did was to develop my own counseling plan. And some behavioral specialists didn't use counseling plans, but that was my background and I was familiar with that. Okay, so um, what I have for you tonight is a, a simple counseling plan, a sample. And what, what is helpful in using a counseling plan, whether you do it formally or informally, some people will keep it in their heads. Okay, or you can just, just jot, down, you know, jot down some notes. Okay? But, I highly recommend that you have some form of counseling plan to follow because what will happen is that it will enable you to zero in on one or two specific goals that you would like to work on. Okay, Dan brought up the question last week about measuring progress. One of the ways you can measure progress is by looking at your counseling plan. Okay. It also helps you to remember what you're working on. And whenever I work with adults and students, before they came in each session, I would take all the consequences. Oh, okay, to refresh my memory, this is what I'm supposed to be working on. This is the presenting problem. These are the objectives and what I'm gonna do. Otherwise, it becomes a blur, especially if you're working with a lot of different people. So, the counseling plan helps you to, to, to stay focused, remain focused on one or two specific goals um, Otherwise, what's going to happen is that this problem comes up, you're going to deal with it. Another problem comes up, you're going to deal with it. Another problem comes up, you're going to be dealing with 10 problems. Okay? And there's not going to be any direction. You're going to be all over the place. So what a counseling plan does is to help you remain focused so that you're not trying to address every problem and concern that is shared. And people will do that. People will come to you, they feel comfortable. They're going to share everything under the sun. Okay? And there's no way you can... You can address every single situation. As I mentioned here, a counseling plan does not need to be a form of document, but instead should serve as a working tool to help you and the person you're counseling remain focused on the issues to be discussed. So, what I developed here was a sample counseling plan that can be used twofold. Uh, one of the problems, or one of the situations that many people in churches will come to you um, and they might not come and say, well, I'm depressed, or if they, if they say I'm depressed or anxious or whatever, a lot of times it's going to be, hey, I want to grow in the Lord. I want to remain steadfast in my walk with Him. Okay. In the churches especially, you're going to be dealing with this a common problem, a common issue. You know, how can I grow in my, in my walk? In my, you know, how can I grow in the Lord and my walk with the Lord? Okay. So, this is a sample counseling plan that you could use and help. But also, this, this is a plan, I purposely developed this so that you can use it to, uh, in your own personal walk and your spiritual growth. So if you have raised the question, well, how can I get close to the Lord and walk with Him? Maybe some of this counseling plan, sample plan, will give you some ideas. Okay, so there's a two-fold purpose. So in a counseling plan, uh, if you can work on one goal, no more than two goals. Okay. Uh, I've, I've been in situations where uh, people say, well, I want to work on six goals. I said, no, you can't work on six goals. We don't have time 
and I don't have energy, and you're not gonna have energy to work on six goals. So let's pick one or two of the most important things you want to work on, okay? So whether a person is depressed, or you know, having problems in their marriage, what is one goal you like to do? And a goal is a general statement. So I have here, to encourage and assist so-and-so in his or her spiritual growth and daily walk with the Lord, okay? Objectives tells us how we're gonna get to uh, that goal, how we're gonna fulfill that goal. So, I, I list it here as an example. We'll spend time each day in Bible reading and reflecting on the truths of God's Word. Secondly, we'll spend time each day in prayer focused on praising and exalting God, acknowledging who He is, and sharing personal burdens, concerns, and requests. And then number three, we'll share with others personal insights gained from reading and reflecting on God's Word and time spent in prayer. Okay, so these, these are things that even though I don't use numbers or percentages, you can measure, okay? because they either do it or they don't, right? You can say, well, are you spending time in daily Bible reading? Oh, no. Okay, I, I, I'm, you know, three out of seven days I'm spending time. Okay. Um, am I spending time in prayer? Um, have you shared what you are learning in your Bible time, your personal devotion? Are you sharing it with anybody? Uh, whether it's family members or close friends, someone else in the church. Okay. You can measure that, either yes or no. You know, like, in, like in high school, I would say, uh, people would criticize me because they said, well, you're not using, you're not saying, uh, you're not using percentages. Okay. So I said, here's my goal, here's my objective for this student. He will not get into any fights you know, uh, during the coming week. He will not get into any fights. Okay. Because some, some people would say, the way you should word this is that you will not get into fights 75% of the time. Well, I don't want the student to get in any fights at all. Okay? So either the student got into a fight or didn't, you can measure that. You, know, you, see, you see what I'm talking about? So it's something you know, black and white. Okay? Or uh, I will read my Bible you know, four out of five days. Okay? And so you ask, well, how many days did you read your Bible this past week? Oh, I didn't read it at all. Well, that's, that's some data that you get. So then the methods will further explain how you're gonna uh, meet the objectives. Okay, so the methods would be identify a specific place and time where daily Bible reading and prayer will occur, ensuring that interruptions and distractions are eliminated. Secondly, identify the approach format to be followed in reading and reflecting on God's word. For example, choose one verse or several verses to read each day, rather than reading through an entire chapter or book of the Bible. Okay. If, a, if, a, if a person is reading through the Bible, the Bible reading plan, you can work that in there. Okay. But, uh, so you can be flexible, but I'm giving you a suggestion here. And uh, in the next handout of notes, uh, I'll give you some scriptures, selected scriptures. Number three, maintain a daily written or digital journal so I put digital because people will put things on the computer or their uh, smartphones. But maintain a daily written or digital journal recording the following. At least one lesson learned or one truth to be applied gleaned from the Bible verse passage of this prayer. And then B, insights gained from time spent in prayer, any answers to prayer. So what they're doing is they're, they're uh, keeping, this is where homework comes in, okay, when we talk about homework. This is part of the homework. Uh, counseling isn't where someone comes to you, talks to you for half an hour or so, and then they leave. Okay, to be really effective, uh, give homework. And homework uh, to, to help a person in their spiritual growth, uh, maintaining a journal, digitally or uh, a written journal. And then four, share with at least one person each week information recorded in the written or digital journal. This person may be an immediate or extended family member, close friend, or church member, and information may be shared in person or via email. Okay. So they have to communicate uh, to the other person, to, uh, at least once, one person a week, what they, have, what they have learned. And then share and discuss journal information with the counselor during each meeting or session. Okay. So um, this is a sample that uh, you could use for yourself in your own spiritual growth and your walk with the Lord. 
but this will come up often when you when you work with people. Okay? Whether they're depressed or they're having some emotional, mental health issues that they're dealing with, a lot of time when you're dealing with uh, people in, in churches or people uh, that know that you are a Christian, it's going to come down to dealing with uh, growth and maturity in their Christian walk. Okay? So uh, I wanted to share that with you so uh, you have that with you and, and you can use it um, uh, to your own benefit as well as to help others. Okay, let me pause um, if you have any questions. The green light on. Hello, anybody there? <laughs> okay, uh, this, this is pertaining to the previous topic. At what point um, can you, do you diagnose a person to be in a position of self-giving? Is there like a category for that? Because everybody is self-centered, right? Most people. Yeah, yeah. And so. a person who's having problems is probably having remorse or whatever you want to say it. But is like self pity something that's pretty dominant in a person who's in who's depressed? Yeah, yeah. So you you mentioned that when there's no diagnostic category of self pity. Okay. Self pity though is a um, a symptom of something else. So when we look at say a person um, is depressed, um, they they may just uh, be down on themselves and. Feel like there's no way out so that might be a sign of depression not necessarily but that's something to look look at uh, uh, does that ask does that answer your question so then um when you kind of recognize that um what is the plan or solution that you can think of to address that that person. Okay, okay. Let's say, let's say a person is self pity. You know, okay. Let me take it back a little further. Um, when you when you're in the process of establishing rapport with an individual, and remember, I was I'll say not only do you listen carefully to what they say, but your observation is how they say things. If they're really making statements like you know, uh, well, you know, I'm no good. Nobody loves me, and I'm a failure in life, and all of that. That's a clue that something you can kind of tuck in the back of your mind and say, uh, uh, let, me, let me deal with it as it comes up. Okay. Um, when, when we look at, and I'll talk about this when we get to depression. When we get to depression, um, some of the homework, a lot of the homework, besides, you know, if you're working with a Christian, it's a lot easier. You can, yeah, you can have scripture, you can, you know, work on the spiritual uh, aspect of it. But, um, one of the things that I get people to look at when they're dwelling in self-pity is, okay, identify for me at least one positive thing, or this is where the Bible reading comes up, okay? One positive thing that was really refreshing to your soul during this week, okay? Or one thing that you learned about yourself and how you're feeling overall. So if there's other things you would do. There's physical activities, and, you know, a person's depressed, so you wanna get them moving. But it's a lot of times they're, they're engaging in negative self-talk. Okay? Like they're, they're down in themselves. I know good, I'm a failure. Or, you know, I'm always making mistakes. Um, you know, I shouldn't be saying this all the time. Those are clues. So we try to um, approach, approach it by countering what they're saying, by looking at solid evidence as to 
uh, things that are happening in that person's life and what they can do to counter that. Okay. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get into more specifics oh. when we get into depression now, some, some really practical it's helps. Kind of related to that yeah, okay, let, let, me, let me share. When, this is an example here, okay? Uh, I don't know how many of you are going to be, you're not going to fall off your chair, but when I was in Idaho, I shared last year I was in a day treatment program. And please understand, back in the late 70s, we didn't have very much as far as resources. Okay, so what, what you're going to think I recommended is going to be harsh, okay? But I was in charge of a day treatment program, and so we had all these uh, people who were uh, chronic psychotic individuals. You know, came to the program five days a week. All the agents, 19 through the 70s. We had one particular boy, well, a young man, he was uh, 19. But he was more like 17, 16. But uh, he went down here. You could, you could tell when he was having uh, a, a bad day or a bad week because he wouldn't shave, he wouldn't, he wouldn't change his clothes, he had body odor, and he just looked tired all the time, depressed. Okay? But as I share with this, is you need to be at the day treatment program every single day. Okay? But he wouldn't come all, all the time. And even though our program, our staff went out to pick up all the clients to bring that, he wouldn't go. So, so one day, um, you know, we had to take practical measures. Yeah, because he was, you know, uh, and he was in self pity and all of that, and just put down himself. So I told the workers, you know, they, they went there, they called me and said, hey Paul, you know, we're at so-and-so's house. He doesn't want to come out. He doesn't want to go to the program. And so I told him, tell him, uh, you're going to kick the door down and drag him out of the house and bring him to the program if he doesn't open up the door. Okay. <laughs> now, because we knew if he didn't come to the program, He'd go downhill so quickly. Then we're gonna spend all this time getting into the hospital, and we're gonna to have to you know, spend staff time, and you know, the, the state is gonna be paying for a lot of the hospitalization. So we knew exactly. So I said, just tell him. Paul said, we're gonna kick the door down if you don't come out and come with us. Well, fortunately, he opened the door and came. And when he came, I said, you know, uh, you know that you need to be here. I said, yeah, you're right, Paul. You know, uh, I just didn't want to come out, but. Uh, I didn't feel like it, but I know I had to. I had to be around other people in the program. And I had to just get away from just lying in bed all day because I know that I'll go to the hospital. Okay. So when we deal with people who are you know, in self-pity or depths of depression, yeah, there's some things, practical things we can do. Okay. For, for us as Christians, we can point them to the Word. You see, part of that is going to be uh, that's why the sample counseling plan, you can use it for any situation, you know, so people, people need to be guided as far as their, their spiritual walk, their spiritual growth, and receive hope you know, from God's word, because that's going to be the primary source that you're going to be utilizing, okay. Uh, you may not have the, you may not have the, the ex experience as a clinician or whatever, okay. Um, but you know, you be yourself, but you have God's word, okay? And you know, the longer you've been in church, you sit under Pastor Jesus teaching and preaching, and you, you watch uh, preachers on television, you, you are, the, the word of God is getting into you, okay? And there's a purpose for that. We're not just taking it all in and just for our own, our own edification, you know? We have those opportunities to learn and, and grow ourselves so that we can help others. So, in, in self-pity is a, is a common sign of depression. And when we get to that subject, um, probably in a couple of weeks, uh, we'll, we'll deal with that as well, you know. But yeah, self-pity, is there's no diagnosis for that, but it's just one of the symptoms. Like, for example, depression, uh, they lose hope, uh, they're not, they don't have any goals in life. They feel sad, they look sad all the time, they feel sad. Um, uh, they start giving away their, their personal property. Okay, when they start, by the way, when people start giving away their personal property, they were, that's a big red flag for suicide. Uh, they start saying, you know what, and they're happy. Okay, I, I see people who aren't, who tried committing suicide, they were very happy. Why? Because they settled in the mind, this is what they're gonna do. 
they've already made the final decision, I'm gonna kill myself. And so it's like a weight went off their, you know, they put off their shoulders. So you might think, if they're happy, oh, okay, they're not depressed, not suicidal, no. If they're depressed and they get happy, uh, that's a big red, red sign, or a red flag. Okay, but we'll, we'll get into that. Um, Did that help, Curtis? Okay, I'm gonna pass out the, uh, the last set of notes, page 12 to 15, on your way maintaining the counseling relationship. And um, in there, you'll have on the last page the list of scriptural uh, passages that you can use. So, you know, read through that, and then um, we'll, we'll look at that. So what we're, you know, Lord willing, what we're going to do is we're going to look at that section next week. We might be able to get through all of that. And the following week, um, we're going to deal with uh, counseling with teenagers. And then the last week, uh, depression and suicide. Okay, and on depression and suicide, I'll have some phone numbers that you can utilize and give to people who are uh, who may need them. Thank you, Josh. So, if, just to go over really quickly, uh, on your way, we're going to be dealing with uh, uncomfortable situations. So again, we're going to talk about silence. We're going to talk about crying, uh, talk about expressions of anger. Uh, we're going to be on page 13, we're going to look at, uh, have some discussion on the use of scripture and counseling and how you can use it. And then homework. Okay? A lot of people think that there's no need for homework in counseling, but homework is, is really, really important. Okay? I've used it with teenagers. And at first they'll say, I have to do homework. I said, no. But then after they learn the, uh, how valuable and how beneficial it is, uh, they go along and say, okay, you know, they accept it. So uh, if, if kids can, are willing to do homework, uh, so should adults, right? So, you know, counseling, remember, counseling is not just coming and talking and going off and forgetting what was said and coming back the following week. No, there's work that goes on in between your meetings. So, so that's what we'll do. We'll talk about that. Maybe next week we'll, uh, this, this last section, verse uh, chapter, pages 12 through 15 is short, so um, we'll probably get into the counseling with teenagers. Counseling with teenagers, I have five pages of notes, and suicide, and depression of suicide is another five pages. So uh, we're getting there, we're almost we're past the halfway mark where we'll, we'll finish. Okay. Any last questions? Any questions? Yeah, go ahead, Russ. Uh, I guess in this age of having the internet and things, um, are, are you going to be covering something like about uh, cyberbullying or something like that? I'm going to mention. Um, mentioned somewhere here about bullying, but uh, that can also include the cyberbullying. But I was going to talk about that in general. I don't know where I put that in here. Oh, I think it's under, let me see, I think it's under depression. Yeah, I have, when we get to the depression, one of the risk factors for depression. So when we get to depression, we're going to talk about um, depression defined, signs and symptoms of depression, and there are 15 signs, by the way. And then for young people, there's another eight signs just for young people. And then risk factors that I have a uh, uh, kind of lengthy paragraph on bullying. Uh, I, and then we have red flags with suicide, how to assess lethality. Okay. The reason why we're going to talk about down the road assessing lethality is that you may be in a, in, a, in a position where you're gonna make the difference as to what happens. Okay. Uh, a person may not tell anybody else um, that they're gonna, they're thinking of ending their life. But if you see enough signs, at least you can address those signs. Okay. Because uh, 
if, if you have all this information and you know, you know, you're not, you're not comfortable because this person is talking about all these things and has showing all these signs, you kind of just turn your back on it. Okay. You kind of just turn your back because if something happens and you say, you know, I saw all those signs and do anything, you're going to feel worse. Okay. Again, you see all these signs, you do what you can, but again, that person is responsible. You know, that person is responsible. Yeah, I don't like it when people I've known kill themselves. Okay. But I never beat myself up, you know, over it. Uh, and I, I, I've known people in my, in my career that killed themselves, but I wasn't working with them. But it's, it's still not a pleasant situation, right? But if it was, you know, I always say, did I do my best? And, and here's, here's, another, here's another thing that just came up, and I was going to uh, share this with you earlier, but I forgot. But when you're involved in a counseling situation, um, talk to somebody that you trust, another member or pastor, or even call me. If you're counseling with someone right now, you don't know what direction to go, feel free to call me or send me an email. Okay, people have done that you know, you know, in, you know, throughout the years I've been here. Feel free to do that. You know, when I was working in mental health center, we'd have regular weekly case discussions. If we had a tough case, we would just meet with staff, the psychologists, social workers, and we say, you know, I'm having this, uh, you know, I don't know what else to do. This is a tough one. And so they would say, try this, try that. Or they would say, well, you know, if it, and, and they would be very, very supportive. Okay. Don't ever feel that in your ministry of counseling within the church that you're going to you know, go uh, alone uh, on this. Okay. You cannot do that. You need support. So if, if there's a, someone you can trust or someone might help you, kind of sort things, okay, this is the way I, you should do, try try this and you know, recommend this, um, do that. You know, you don't just talk with anybody now, but that's important. Okay. We had a, professionally, we needed that. We, need, we had that opportunity to discuss cases. Even when I was at DOE, you know, every week we got together with staff for the behavioral health specialist and we talked about the tough things. Hey, we, we, got, we got this situation and you know, we don't know what else to do. We tried this, tried that, and suggestions. So at least there was a support. They knew that we're doing all that we could. And you know, don't feel like you have to go at it alone. Okay, I just want to leave that with you. Okay, it's eight o'clock, so uh, why don't we close for uh, tonight. If you have any other questions, just fire an email to me and then I'll address them uh, during uh, our sessions. Um, take, the, take a look next week, read over the, um, the handout, maintain the counseling relationship, and then we'll go from there. Heavenly Father, we thank you for our time together. Thank you for the questions, for the discussion. We just pray, Lord, that uh, the things that were said tonight and shared uh, will really help us as we seek to minister to others in need. And thank you for this opportunity, for the, for the lives you bring across our path, and the fact that we can make a difference. Uh, may we continue to focus men's eyes, women's eyes on the Lord Jesus Christ, and to put our trust in Him, that uh, He will provide uh, the resources that we need, the wisdom that we need, as we continue to minister to others. We look forward to our time together on Sunday and just uh, protect us as we go to our homes. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Okay. Just a reminder uh, to continue practicing